Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the August 10th board workshop special meeting of the Board of Trustees of Goose Creek Consolidated Independent School District. Uh, at this time, I would like to declare that we are having a telephone and video conference meeting held under suspended OMA laws. A version might be on March 16th, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by Attorney General Ken Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meeting laws to the extent necessary to allow telephonic and or video conference meetings in response to the coronavirus COVID-19. For more information about the suspension, see TASB Legal Services article, Texas Governor Suspends Certain Provisions of Open Meetings Act Due to Coronavirus COVID-19 PDF. In accordance with those suspended rules, we certify the following. <clears throat> uh, Secretary Sampson, was this meeting properly posted? Yes, it was. And at this time, although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location or may, we do have a quorum in attendance at this meeting by video conference. Can you certify such? Secretary Sampson. Yes, there is. Thank you. We are meeting by use of Cisco WebEx software application, which allows two way communication for members of the public. As we would at any in person meeting, members of the public who have followed the instructions on the meeting notice for registering to speak during the public comment portion will be unmuted for up to three minutes to speak. If the speaker submitted written comments in advance, the board secretary will uh, read the comments into record before or during the board's consideration of that item. If you would like to provide comment at a future meeting conducted by video conference or telephone call, please follow the instructions on the posted meeting notice. All other meeting procedures will adhere to board adopted procedures to the extent practicable. An audio recording of this meeting is being made and will be available to the public at a later date. This software application allows for 1,000 people to view and interact at a time we apologize in advance for any unforeseeable difficulties and ask for your patience as we navigate unprecedented conditions. And finally, if you have questions about these suspended laws, please call the Office of the Attorney General at 888-672-6787 or by email at toma at oag.texas.gov. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. O'Brien to introduce our board workshop on diversity training. Dr. Madam President, thank you very much, board members. Uh, those joining us virtually, uh, we're pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Roger Cleveland. Uh, he'll be presenting a workshop tonight on equity and excellence. Dr. Cleveland has been at the forefront of equity and inclusion for over a decade now. His expertise lies in such areas as cultural proficiency, instructional equity, implicit bias, closing the achievement gaps, learning styles, transforming school culture, conducting culture audits, and school improvement planning. He's conducting training sessions addressing equity and culture issues from Alaska to Mississippi, including his presence here at Goose Creek this past fall in October, in which he presented to all principals and district directors in which uh, in the spring semester early on, I believe January or February, uh, we turned around and presented his presentation in the trainer of trainer models to all faculty members throughout Goose Creek. Dr. Cleveland is a native of Middlebury's, Middlesboro, Kentucky, currently resided, residing in Lexington, Kentucky and has taught at Moorhead State University, University of Kentucky, Middle Tennessee State University, Eastern Kentucky, the School of Education at Kentucky State University, where he is now a full professor, and he serves as the director for the Center for Research in Eradication of Educational Disparities. He has been recognized as Professor of the Year, and in 2013 received the P.G. Peebles Equity and Excellence Achievement Award. He is a member of the Fayette County Public Schools Equity Council and the Millennium Learning Concepts Consulting Company. We are proud to have with us this evening, Dr. Roger Cleveland. Are you with us, Dr. Cleveland? 
Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. You may begin. Thank you. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. O'Brien. I just want to thank you all for inviting me this evening uh, to have this conversation. I pref uh, prefer to call it a, a uh, conversation of facilitation versus training because the person who has the um, the access to the PowerPoint and the clicker, they, the assumption is they know everything, but there's a knowledge base um, in different rooms for tonight for obvious reasons. And so I'm just facilitating the conversation. I would like to talk about uh, equity and excellence and uh, throughout the uh, conversation, I will pose a few questions that are not rhetorical and want to just have a response back for some of um, the board members and other uh, district staff who's uh, uh, in attendance. <clears throat> so let's get started. All right. The purpose to establish a common understanding of education equity and make sure we're all on the same page about education equity. Uh, stops a common understanding of racial equity and create a systemic focus on education equity. So we're gonna make sure we have common language. I think that's really important uh, in, in doing that. And so you can move forward and have uh, some good conversations about educating uh, all children when we have common language in education. So that's the three things we're gonna talk about uh, this evening. Uh, and so just at a glance, we're going to talk about education equity, ed equity literacy, equity literate educators, uh, talk about opportunity gaps. And then the, the biggest piece I want to talk about is really a, uh, a pathway uh, to equity, to ensure equity uh, in the district and make sure we're all on the same page. Looks like a lot, but it won't take that long. You know, we'll be all right. So setting the context of our conversation, I'm going to just give out about three or four assumptions that we can make about education all students uh, deserve the best possible education they can have provide regardless of socioeconomic status, class, gender identity, religion, citizenship, status, ability, disability, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or et cetera. So regardless of your, your background or whatever is going on with that, you, every child deserves uh, an equitable education. You can agree to that. Yep. All right. Assumption two, education is not politically, socially neutral. Educators decide what to teach. Educators decide how to teach. And educators decide how we assess. So even though we like to think that our, our thinkings are pure and things like that, in reference to educating children, they are. But our biases do seep into our decisions and what to teach, how to teach, and how we assess students. So the assumption is that we're not, this is not politically neutral in education as much as we would like for it to be. Assumption three, the achievement gap is a lot more, it's really more of an opportunity gap. And what that means is the children in Baytown and in Goose Creek uh, School District is not getting what they need. Some are and some are not. Some students will have the opportunity when they leave transition from school into life, they have more opportunities than others. That's what I mean, the achievement gap, yes, it's an achievement gap, but we're looking at what kind of opportunities the students have once they leave your school district. And this is a little design to show you that everybody doesn't start out equal. And the fourth one is that every single teacher, administrator, all these issues, systemic inequities in the entire school system society, you know, all these equities come in, these inequities come into our school district. Some things that we can't control, so we cannot as teachers and social workers and principals and administ uh, administrators, central office staff, some things we cannot control to seep into our district. But the one thing we at least we should not do is be complicit in, in those inequities in our own space and our influence. So we don't want to perpetuate those inequities once they come into the schools. Our schools are like microcosms of what's going on in society. Whatever happens to society is happening in our schools. And so uh, if there's sexism in our in our society, there's sexism in our schools. If there's racism in our society, there's racism in our schools. If there's classism in our society, there's classism in our schools. And make sure that we're not, as educators, are being complicit in those inequities. So those are assumptions that we can make as we move forward. All right, I'm gonna ask you all a question and you, anybody can chime in, okay? Imagine, imagine that a peer district decided to visit your district to review your equity practices. 
You gotta keep that in mind. Would your visitors consider the schools in central office as very equitable? And why or why not? So that's a question for any of you all in the room or not in the room that's on the on the WebEx that would like to respond to that. If you have a neighboring district that came and just reviewed and visit your school district, would a visitor say that our schools in central office are pretty equitable? Anyone can respond. Are you referring to how it looks when you come in or are you referring to just how uh, everything operates? Everything operates. It, you can talk it, you can look at it from perspective of student achievement. You can look at it from access. You can look at it data, uh, discipline. Uh, you can look at hiring practices, who gets stretch assignments. If they came to visit, what would they say about your district? How equitable it was? If they're they were just visiting, uh, they wouldn't know right offhand what exactly the district would be unless they look at numbers. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers, then we may fall behind some of the other districts and even the state. Or some of the uh, things that we need to be doing for as equity practices, especially for as hiring and promotions and uh, things of that nature. Okay, so if they stayed long enough to assess some data and things of that nature. You all may not be where you need to be in reference, particularly around hiring practices and things of that nature. Right. Okay. Anyone else? I may not be answering your question, but I find the graphic, the, the photograph here, very um, truth, truth to what we see in ourselves versus what other people see us sometimes. Okay, that's fine. I, I think maybe it's it's a little bit telling that nobody's just jumping in and saying, "Oh yeah, it's great." Um, maybe we we feel deep down that it's really not that equitable in some cases. Okay. And maybe we just don't know. Maybe so. <laughs> and, you know, that's an interesting point that maybe we just don't know. And, or we're not ready to say we are, we're not, which is an issue. And it's also an issue if we don't know. Uh, so let's, we're going to define equity. And after we define it and see if we're all on the same page about that, we can revisit that question. And, and we're also going to look at some data also. And then you, you can also maybe chime in later to say, Yes, maybe we are, maybe we're not. We're doing well in these areas, in this area we need to work on. Okay, which is usually the case for most school districts anyway. So. Ben, we can, we can't hear you. I don't know, you're unmuted. Check your button. We're dealing with a- right, Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. You can go back. It talked about equitable, being like opportunities. Yes. I think this. I think we try. I don't think we're equitable, but I think we try to provide opportunities across the board the best we can district wide. There's some vast improvement we need to make. And like uh, Mr. Sampson talked about the the data closing gaps, things like that. I don't I don't know if the opportunities that we try to create different opportunities if it actually translate to actually seeing the data because there are still the gaps there and so we're trying to for me it's to connect these are the opportunities and how do we tran translate that and actually show it into the data and the scores and closing those gaps how do we see it all the way through i think okay. that's a tough thing for me to figure out <laughs> i'd like to also add a, a couple of comments as far as equity we don't have um we have we're missing some Equity as far as buildings go, we have some older buildings in the order area of town that uh, we had uh, recently. We got one elementary is being rebuilt, but because of this age, we had issues with the infrastructure, plumbing, things of that nature. Um, but we also have other schools that are that are missing those kind of, of things because of their their age and their size. Um, I would also agree with Mr. Sampson as far as not being equitable in the employees. Um, it doesn't anywhere near reflect the, our student population as far as 
people with professional degrees. And finally, also with our, our scores, I think there's a lot of room to close the gap um, in that regard as well. Okay. And while we're having this, uh, while we're having this conversation and, um, and you're making your comments, why don't we do a, a mental assessment of the district as we, as we talk about this? Because some of you are raising some good uh, points. So just think about it and reflect about um, the why uh, some of those things are in place. And we can discuss that. I'm going to skip along to education equity. Okay, this is how there's a number of different ways how to define this, but I want to define it this way. Education equity means that educational practices, policies, and I want to pause right there, that policies are critical, particularly for at the board level. That's one of the primary responsibilities, uh, almost the primary responsibility of a, a school board and board of trustees is to create policies that will support the work that the superintendent and other people in the districts are in the schools are doing. So the policies are really important and an equitable policy is really important. Facilities, academic support, curriculum, instruction, school resource, school climate and culture expectations. That these facts are such that all students have an equitable opportunity, not equal, but equitable fairness and access to reach academic excellence regardless of race, social economic status, gender, disabilities, language, giftedness, national origin, religion, and other characteristics. So I just want to pull a couple of things out of this that's, that's really important. One of the number one issues around ensuring uh, we address equity is access. Is access and making sure every student who walks into the classroom receives access to a rigorous instruction and rigorous curriculum and rigorous content. And so this is a rhetorical question. You know, what are all students receiving rigorous content and rigorous instruction? Because if if we believe that the, I think you all's assessment is the state assessment is called a star. If the state assessment is considered rigorous and all your students are not getting access to rigor, why would we expect them to be proficient when they take the state assessment? And so those, you know, those things have to be aligned, if that makes sense. Um, and fairness. And so equal, everybody gets the exact same thing. Equitable, everyone gets what they need. In other words, um, Title I is an equity issue because based on the number of students who are on free and do lunch and things of that nature, in your school or your district, you don't get the same amount of money as a leaf or all Dean for different reasons because of the amount of students who are on free and do lunch. So we don't just give a blanket amount of money to every district that's in the Houston area. It's based on need. And so key things to remember about equity is not equal. Okay, it's equitable and access is critical. For instance, and you'll see later in the presentation that I'll pull some data from uh, uh, U.S. district and one of the most uh, lowest performing group of students is students with disabilities. I'm a firm believer that most students with disabilities can do really well in the classroom with the right accommodations. Research tells us that most students who are in special education have an average IQ. So with the right accommodations and good teaching, those students can fare just as well as anyone else. But a lot of times, because we uh, they don't get access to rigorous content, and then we assess them on rigorous content, they don't do well. And so we have to make sure all students are getting access um, to the content at the appropriate times. And so if we pull anything out of this equity piece, it's about access, it's about uh, making sure things are equitable, not equal. And it's also about fairness and providing opportunities to all children in the district. Let's look at racial equity. And racial, racial equity is pretty much kind of the same uh, concept, but a real short definition, the condition where one's race identity has no influence on how one fares in society. So in other words, in this case, it should make a difference who walks into the classroom, they should be have an opportunity to do well in school, their race should not be a reason or a barrier for them to be successful. 
and race equity culture, one that is focused on proactively countering race inequities inside and outside of an organization or in schools for that matter. And so I'm, I'm really a, a person that's really big on organizational culture or school culture and that culture eats strategies for breakfast. And what I mean by that, if you don't have an environment that's conducive for learning and where, where we understand that students get everything that they need and we create that kind of culture, then putting strategies in a culture that's not toxic or not ready for it is like putting gas in a car that doesn't run. So you got to create a culture uh, of high expectations, uh, academic expectations and behavioral expectations uh, within the school. But race equity is that to ensure that race is not the, the reason why students have not been successful. It's not a barrier uh, in that situation. And so let's look at building a race, uh, race equity culture. Race equity culture is one, one that focuses on proactive counteraction of race inequities inside and outside of a school. Building race equity culture is the foundational work when school districts seek to advance racial equity. It creates the conditions, the culture that helps us adopt anti-racist mindsets and actions. So race equity, once again, is to make sure that our race and ethnicity is not the reason why our students are not been successful in our classrooms. This one's really important. Uh, Educational leaders, I think every teacher uh, in this country, and since we're talking about Goose Creek this evening, every teacher needs to be able to understand what we mean by educational literacy or equity literacy. Equity literacy is comprised of the skills and dispositions that enable educators to do these three things. One, we get in the classroom, we need to be able to recognize inequities in the classroom. We need to be able to respond to those inequities and be able to re redress or eradicate those conditions that deny some students access to educational opportunities enjoyed by their peers. So if one, first we gotta even recognize, first of all, we gotta know what equity means. And then once we know what equity means, we need to be able to recognize the inequities in our classrooms. Because if we don't recognize inequities in our classroom, you're not gonna be able to close opportunity gaps because you're not giving students what they need. Then, so we have to recognize it and to respond to it in an appropriate way, in a very culturally responsive way and then eradicate and change those conditions of the situation with that. That's what we mean by equity literacy. And equity literate educators, not only do they recognize and draw upon the resiliency and other funds of knowledge accumulated by poor students of color and reject deficit views that focus on, this is the important part, reject deficit views that focus on fixing disenfranchised students rather than fixing the things that disenfranchise students. So in other words, our students are not broke. They don't need to be fixed. They don't need to be repaired. Every student comes in to all your schools, okay, with a knowledge base. And I just want to pull what that means, funds of knowledge out there for a second. Funds of knowledge is what students bring to school every day. So even though teachers are trying to teach them certain content and areas like that, they may not know that content, that knowledge base, but they have a knowledge base when they come to school. And they get that funds of knowledge from their families, their communities and other places. So they bring that knowledge into the community. I'll give you an example. Uh, in my neighborhood where I live, they're, they're building a lot of homes. And, and I see on the weekends and even during the weekdays, I see a number of uh, Latino men doing construction. And some of the men, they own their own companies and things like that, and they're doing construction in my neighborhood. So on the weekends, they, they bring their sons with them to help them do some construction. And the, 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 the children they bring with them live right maybe a half a mile from my neighborhood. They attend this middle school. And the middle school is about 40% uh, Latinx, about 45% African-American, and the remaining students are white students. And it's about 89% free induced lunch. So when these, these um, men are doing construction in my neighborhood, they bring their sons with them on the weekends, my question before I go forward, is there any math in construction? Somebody answer that question for me. Absolutely. Quite a bit of math, right? So these young men who come with their fathers who work, help them with construction every weekend, they will go back to school 
on that Monday and sometimes not having the ability to do fractions or even basic measurements, even though they were doing them all weekend because we don't tap into their funds of knowledge. And so it's not the way that they, you know, the, it's not the way we teach math, then they don't tap into that knowledge base. So funds and knowledge is what students bring to school and they bring from their, their homes and their families and, and, and communities and things like that. But a lot of times, because some students are poor or have these other things they bring to school with them, we approach it from a deficit mindset versus a difference mindset. And so, especially with working with children who are poor, we need to have a difference orientation, not a deficit orientation. A deficit orientation is that our mindset is these students are so poor, or you know, we can't help them, we're gonna you know, water down the instruction, they probably can't get it, you know, there's no support at home, where that's not how we should approach it. We should approach it from a difference orientation. They have knowledge, they bring it to school every day. If you don't think they know nothing, just sit in the cafeteria one day, they know quite a bit. So we should have a difference orientation that, what that means is they have a different knowledge base and what good teachers do, they connect with connect to students what they don't know to what they do know, okay? And that's called prior knowledge. And so we have to tap into their funds of knowledge, but students are not broken. They may not have the content, and the knowledge base that we're trying to teach them, but they don't need to be repaired and they don't need to be fixed. Okay. We need to fix the things that actually disenfranchise our students, which means we remove barriers and that's an equitable practice. All right. Equity does not mean that every student should receive identical instruction. Instead, it demands that reasonable and appropriate accommodations be made as needed to promote access and attain for all students. So we mean by equity and then fair. Equity is, a, is the process, equality is the outcome. What does that mean? Somebody tell me what that means after this conversation we've had about equity. What do I mean by equity is the process, equality is the outcome? Well, I think you're referring back to uh, like the achievement gaps. Um, when you're talking about, I believe you said it was achievement gaps are more related to opportunity gaps. And the opportunity gap comes at the end of their education cycle. Um, if equity is the process, then they're all going to have an equal opportunity at the end of the course of their education system in public education system. Exactly. Exactly. So, Jessica, if you and I were to start out in kindergarten together or preschool, and I receive an equitable education, which means from the time I started preschool, I received everything I needed to be successful. Now, I also had that some skin in the game also, so I had to do my part. You know, I did that, but if you received an equal education, that means you got the exact same thing everybody's received, okay? Even how we even, you know, present the content, okay? Even though you had different kind of learning styles where you receive information, you still got it the same like everybody else. Then when we get to the 12th grade, you may not be able to uh, apply all the information that you learned for 13 years. Well, I can apply that because I received everything I need. So it's basically what, you, what you're just saying, that when you finish, I'm probably gonna have more opportunities because I've been better prepared because I received everything I needed. That's the equity. So this is a rhetorical question, not just for Jessica, for anyone. Are the children in Goose Creek receiving an equitable education? or equal education. I just wanna park that right there for a second, and let you all think about it, okay? And uh, I know that it's board members here and then other people uh, on the leadership team that's in, that's listening in and interacting. But you know, every now and then, you know, we can go in the classroom and see what's going on, right? Right, board members? We can see. Sure. So think about that rhetorical question. Are the children in the district receiving an equitable education? or equal education, or, and if I go too far, it's Jessica's fault because she's got me on the road now. Ask this other question, are the children there, are they being schooled or are they been educated? Schooling is going to school for 13 years, okay? And receiving knowledge, okay? Education is going through school 13 years and receiving knowledge, but being able to apply that knowledge. 
that's being educated. Schooling, you're just getting information. But if you can't apply it, okay, you weren't really educated. And there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Okay, and wisdom can apply that knowledge. The difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. But wisdom knows you don't put tomatoes in fruit salad. Okay. <laughs> Distinct difference. Okay. So what kind of, are we getting an equal pro, uh, education or equal education? Let's keep that in mind. Opportunity gaps. All right. Uh, since I see Richard on the screen, Richard, will you scribe for me? Sure. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm, I'm going to ask people to just call out some reasons and you'll understand what I'm talking about in a second. Um, and just when they yell out some of the reasons, it's called call and response is what we do. You just catch them. Okay. Just write them down. All right. All right. <clears throat> so before we get to that, here's some data and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You all probably seen it before. So all I'm saying is that the reason why I'm going to do this exercise is because in some places, particularly around special education, is probably the most alarming uh, gaps that I saw with the, these data, um, where you know, seventeen percent of the students are you know uh, at at a grade level. Uh, this is star reading, okay, and so uh, those are there's some opportunity gaps in in different places here with different groups of people, particularly the lowest performing groups of students are. African American and those who are in special education. So imagine, Richard, if you are an African American male and poor and in special education. Okay, so this even we're not even disaggregating it to we're getting gender specific or even the overlaps. So, so if you're if you're white and in special ed and you're on free and just lunch or economic disadvantage, you all call it. They may not be at 18% in reference to meeting grade level. And so these uh, these are what we're talking about. The this, this is the why we're having this conversation about equity. This is the why right here and how we plan to get our students where they need to be. And this is just another look. Uh, this is third grade math scores. And you all set some goals, which is good, but we have to have a, you know, I used to work for the Kentucky Department of Education and school district has some great goals and great strategic plans and school improvement plans and the dust was just thick as the plans because once we it was because what we what the districts did sometimes they did the plans out of compliance and not commitment and so as we go through you all have set goals and things like this we want to make sure we have a commitment culture and not a compliance culture in other words if um, the folks in austin didn't say we had to do these things will we do it anyway that's a commitment culture. If we're doing certain these things around closing opportunity gaps because they're saying it, that's a compliance gap. But anyway, let's get to my exercise. Okay, I want some people to call out. Why do some students struggle academically in your district? Just yell it out and Richard will capture it. Why do some students struggle academically in your district? Low socioeconomic. Okay, can we put poverty? Is that Poverty. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, do because of um, it kind of in the same vein, but not the same necessarily. But a lot of the kids in certain situations have to work and help provide. Okay. I, I think also the digital divide. Okay. Other reasons. Attendance. Okay. Richard, tell me when you get to about seven or eight, we'll stop. All right. Not the sometimes the parents or whoever's at home doesn't have the academic knowledge to help them out to to reinforce what they've learned in the, during the day. Can we say uh, home life and family engagement, something like that? Yes. Is that it's okay? Not, not a lack of family care, just simply they don't have the tools. Okay. All but, right. But you can also say lack of family care because a lot of kids are one family. Uh, households are either living with grandparents or something. Okay. So, Richard, how many do I have right now? We're up to five. Oh, that's it? Okay. Give me at least two more. Give me two more. Language barrier. Okay. Language barrier. Give me one more. Emotional poverty. Emotional uh, poverty, you said? Yes. Okay. Some trauma issues and things of that nature? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. So we have seven. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right, Richard, read them off to me. All right, poverty, work, work to provide, uh, the digital divide, attendance, home life and family engagement, language barriers, and emotional poverty. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm going to talk about opportunity gaps through the lens of Stephen Covey. I know y'all probably like, he's lost his mind, <laughs> but bear with me. In his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talks about the circle of concern versus the circle of influence. And basically what he says is that in his book, that people who are constantly focused on things that they have little influence over, okay, they get tired, they get worn, and after a while, when they are not making an impact, they come up with reasons or excuses why things are not working out well, okay? On the other hand, the circle of influence, he says, people who focus on things they have a lot of influence over tend to be more successful than those who focus in the circle of concern, which they have little influence over things. The circle of concern, they focus on things they have little control over or little influence over. Circle of influence, they have a lot of control over, a lot of influence, okay? Now, Richard read off the reasons why some students do not do well in your district academically. And this is usually the reasons why. Now, I didn't, I didn't ask you all beforehand, did I? I didn't know, y'all didn't know I was gonna ask, and you know, students' cultural background, peer pressure, attendance, neighborhood, home life, family involvement. And then most of the ones that you all mentioned, these are all areas of circle of concern. Now, all these things matter, don't get me wrong. They are really important. You need to be in school if you're gonna learn, right? Okay, you need to have some things in, at home that will help support what you do at school. Families need to be involved. Um, peer pressure is an issue. I don't think cultural background is an issue, but I put that on there because that's what I hear a lot. Uh, the neighborhood, the zip code you live in could be a problem, things of that nature. All of these are concerns or issues that could, you know, could impact whether a student is going to be successful or not. But you think about it, most of these things do not have anything to do with pretty much teaching and learning. Is that a fair statement? Okay, and so the things on Richard's list, how much do those have to do with directly with teaching and learning, Richard? Maybe the digital divide. Maybe, the, exactly, which is crucial right now, right? Yes. So whoever said that, you're right on point. But all these, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these things don't matter. They matter, but it really, these, are, these things right here are like for school social workers, school psychologists, you know, folk, their job, they've been trained to do a lot of these things right here. But teaching and learning takes place in the classroom. Now, let me show you that things that we have influence over campus administrators, classroom teachers. We have influence over inequities, whether we create them or not, culturally responsive teaching, rigor, instructional support, academic behavior expectations, relationships. Don't we have a lot of influence over that at the building level? Only Rich is the only one said yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So based on this exercise, we may spend more time in the circle of concern versus the circle of influence. Okay. Because these are the things that we have a lot of influence over. Even though the families, a lot of families may not come to school and they're not necessarily engaged, we don't teach family. We don't teach parents. We teach students. We would love for them to be engaged. We we know it's important. But if we spend more time on this, okay, I guarantee you some of those opportunity gaps will close versus spending time on that for classroom teachers, because there's other people who have been hired to deal with some of these things right here. So both things and both circles are important, but where teaching, learning, and, and instruction happens in the classroom, these are things that we have little influence over but we have a lot of influence over these things. So we wanna be sure we're putting our time in, particularly for classroom teachers and they're been supported to do these kinds of things right here. 
Because if not, yeah, we're going to struggle. Those numbers are probably not going to change much. And and now, and now the fact we if we rely on teachers to do all this, you know, that's a lot for a classroom teacher. Even a lot of them do it. When would they do this? You know what I'm saying? That makes sense. So we got to make sure our, our our priorities are straight for everybody who's been trained to do different things. Both circles matter, but our classroom teachers can't do all that in the circle of concern and then also the circle of influence. Okay, they will struggle. So where do we go from here? We talked about equity. We talked about racial equity. We looked at opportunity gaps and things of that nature. So I believe that in order for us to actually have a major impact, um, the skill is actually the, probably the easy part. It's the will that we have to work on. You know, when I say we, I mean the entire district, not, we usually just talk about classroom teachers and that's where the road meets the road, but at the same time, it's everybody uh, has to be accountable and have to be supportive of those classroom teachers. So in order to make this systemic and focused, we have to create a pathway to education and create an equity plan. And here are three things that you know you ought to consider. One, um, review your policies and practices to make sure that we're not creating barriers to learning for students. And, and look at our policies. I remember my, my daughter, she's out of school now, and, uh, and uh, she was a middle school cheerleader. And to be a cheerleader, it costs $780 in middle school. And so there was probably a lot of other girls who was better than she was. Her daddy just happened to have the check. Okay, so that policy, and in Kentucky, schools create their own policy at the school level. And that was a pay or play, pay to play policy. Well, we left out a lot of kids because they didn't have the resources. And so, you know, some students got, you know, not because they were the, the best in this particular, whether it's basketball, sports, or theater, band, you know, whatever it was, it was paid, you know, pay to play. And that's an inequity. It created a barrier to, you know, some students being um, uh, engaged in extracurricular activities. So reviewing our policies and practices to make sure there's no uh, barriers to um, success there. And then a comprehensive equity assessment. And what that basically is, uh, is that we do a very, comprehensive look at the district. And so through the lens of equity and organizational culture. And so there's a quantitative side where it was called a desk audit. And we look at all you all's data, discipline data, achievement data, uh, past surveys and things of that nature. That's the quantitative part. We look at student work and see what's proficient work looks like and things like that in the district. The second part is the qualitative part where you interview students, teachers, central office staff, board members, uh, support staff, family members, and community folks. And what we're trying to see is get people's perceptions and perspectives of the school district. But the other side, we're also looking at how the school is performing and what could be uh, creating these opportunity gaps. The desk guys call it a red flag analysis. For instance, now I haven't looked at any discipline data Okay, at Goose Creek, you know, even though I've been there and I, I talked to the principals and things like that, we really didn't talk about discipline. But I can guarantee you this in some schools, not all the schools, and because I haven't been in the schools in Goose Creek, but I just know it's all over the country. Many times, particularly young men and young men of color, and particularly young men of color who are poor, they tend to get suspended for more discretionary or subjective reasons than other students. In other words, I can go to a middle school and see a student get written up for an infraction that's like for fail to follow rules, um, disrespect, insubordination, which a lot of those, some of those are questionable based on the perception of the adult who's writing the student up. But then a lot of times white students will be written up for very clear objective reasons, fights, drugs, weapons, crystal clear. And so what I ask school districts to look at, look at the percentage, look at all their infractions, 
Okay, the students are being written up for and suspended and things of that nature. And then look at the percentage of those suspensions that are very subjective or discretionary versus they're crystal clear. Okay, and you will see the same group of students who are struggling academically are the same group of students who have been suspended more. Okay, now I haven't looked at you all's discipline data, but does it look like that? Yep. That is a question I was looking for a response. Yes, it does. I think that's it pretty good? accurate. Pretty accurate. Now, I, and I promise you, I have not looked at any, so it's not just a Goose Creek. But since we're talking about Goose Creek today, um, so, and what happens is what creeps in is our biases, which we all have, our implicit biases, which are usually unconscious, we're not aware of, unintentional, but impactful. And so if our if our teachers and administrators are not getting training on implicit bias, I think we are considered also. So it's not like, you know, Jessica is a teacher at one of the middle schools and she's just lying in bed on Sunday, night, like, oh, I can't wait to wait, get to work and suspend some Latino kid. She's not thinking like that, but she may get to school that day because of her unknown biases, say something that will trigger some kind of behavior from that kid. That kid acts out, then they're suspended. So that's just one example that our biases may play out in our schools, which is also we all have them. Most of our biases are implicit and unconscious. So we're not aware we're doing them until somebody brings them. Um, and our biases come from our lived experiences and our perspectives in the past. So I just use discipline because you all said it's pretty accurate and I haven't even looked at any data this one data is just like that. We just know, I know it's probably happening. So my question is, and Dr. O'Brien, this is not for you or any of your staff. This is strictly for the board members, okay? So my question is, how often do you all examine that data, the discipline data, board members? Discipline or achievement data? Once a year. Once a year, okay? Could I be so bold to say we probably need to do it minimum quarterly? And because all I say that is, um, how you pronounce your name? Is it Augustine? How you pronounce your name? Augustine. Augustine. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thanks. So think about like think about achievement data. If we test our kids and then the following year we look at the results and we talk about it, whatever, and we don't look at it again, you know. We all, we go to the doctor, right, to get checkups. We get checkups and we get that one annual physical, right? Well, if we don't do checkups throughout the year, we're not gonna know what's ailing us. And so we really don't fix it until we don't fix it. So we get the same results the following year. Um, and so that's called an academic autopsy. I mean, our students died academically, okay? Because we only check them one time a year. We have to now, I, I suspect talking to the principals that they look at it more often um, than you all do, but I think I would suggest that they bring this one data and achievement data to you all minimum quarterly, because remember now you all making policy. And the only way you can really make equitable policies by have good information, correct? And so that's something you ought to consider. Uh, is doing. Okay, so I talked about the comprehensive assessment and got uh, veered off about discipline. And the other one is equity policy, equity plan, and equity scorecard. I, I know you have a strategic plan and a district uh, plan and things like that. Do you have equitable strategies embedded in that plan that you're aware of? Because because the, the strategic plan drives the work, correct? I would like to believe so, but I have to read it again now. Okay. And so uh, you want to make sure that you have equitable strategies. And what you can do is you have your strategic plan because you don't want to have two plans. Okay. Then everybody's going, which one's priority, right? Uh, so what you want to do is have your strategic plan, but you also want to have an equity plan. But your equity strategies and goals are embedded into the strategic plan to make sure it gets the attention that it needs, but also if a community member or a parent or whatever just says, do you have an equity plan? You can pull that out by itself and show you, here's the things we're doing to address equity. That makes sense, Richard? Yes. Yep. 
Okay, so you embed that in there to make sure it gets done because strategic plan, that way you're not having principals and uh, assistant superintendents and things like this trying to go off two or three plans, but you embed that work in there. So you have to, I'm gonna go all the way back from an hour ago, you have to assess where you are first before you actually can start doing the planning. I think that, if I may. Yes, go ahead, sir. I think part of the issue is sometimes uh, we get boggled down in, in the idea of equality. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a, a, a big, yeah, earlier we were talking about assessing uh, what, what is stopping kids from learning. Well, we didn't talk about what's stopping kids from, you were correct, about what's stopping kids learning in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I do think that a big part of that is, is uh, empathy. I think a lot of our people in, in as far as employees uh, have an issue with empathy. In fact, I can tell you that, that probably there's a lot of kids that are probably have more are more influenced by people that are either paraprofessionals or people that are working not necessarily as professionals, as teachers and administrators that connect more with kids just because they know where the kids are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you several examples of kids, of teachers, kids, people that I've met that were influenced by people that were not teachers. And, and I say that as a teacher myself. And, and that's one of the things that I think is important in creating plans like this is we have to build uh, some sort of uh, toolkit for empathy. Uh, and just because you don't, you didn't live like I did, or I don't live like you did, doesn't mean that I don't feel or shouldn't be able to try to understand what, what you're going through and why it's hard for you to learn. You know, there's things such as I, I as a teacher, I teach high school. A lot of our kids don't want to go home. They, they complain about school, but it's, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, they're still hanging out. You know, there's a reason for that. And, and it's hard when you're kicking the kids out of school and say, hey, y'all need to get out of here. Well, where are they going? Where are you sending them to? Um, and I think that comes with trying to create a, a culture of, of trying to fulfill that need. Um, you know, we have complaints such as kids aren't allowed to speak Spanish in class during non-instructional time or even at lunchtime. And you ask, you know, is this happening? We don't get any feedback over what the end result was at. Was it addressed? Was it not addressed? Meanwhile, we have to go back to those people making those um, allegations and say, well, they're going to address it. Well, how do we know? You know, and, and I think that's another thing as a board is something important for us because we want to make sure that if people are telling us that they don't feel like they're being treated. I'll, I'll use the word equally, even if they're not treated equally, mm -hmm. not even equity, not even with equity, but equally, how can we how can those kids have have faith in the system? If they're seeing that it's not treating them correctly, even even at an equal level. Okay, you made a very very good point. Um, now, did you say that the students are not allowed to speak Spanish during non-academic terms? Uh, I I've heard that from two different campuses. Yes. Okay, that's all another conversation with. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just what I was trying to say was I'm not trying to out anybody, but what no. I'm trying to say that these are diff very important issues. In order for our kids to to uh, to be able to perform academically, they have to be invested. Mm -hmm. It's it's our job to get them invested. Mm -hmm. you know, we can sit there and say, well, you know, it it starts at home. Well, I I served on a board a long time ago. We used to have a board member that straight up told me he goes, it's not our our fault, but it is our problem to try to get these kids at a level of education. And and part of that is making sure that they feel welcome in the schools, mm -hmm. that they go to a school that that looks just as good as anyone else, that they're treated with the same amount of of fairness as anybody else, because the kids, if, if we're looking at it from a strictly numbers game where we're seeing, okay, what you just said earlier about which kids get in trouble and, and why and how they get in trouble, <clears throat> the kids are, are keen to that. They know exactly which teacher or which administrator or which campus is, is going to treat them a certain way. And, and I, I think that one of our biggest follies as adults is we don't understand that kids are very much aware of their surroundings and how people act and react to them. I mean, if, if you talk to, to students or if we treat students as human beings instead of what we perceive that children should be treated as, then that's part of the problem. Well, I think you just mentioned a couple of things that are part of like some facilitations. One you're mentioning, you're talking about uh, implicit bias. Um, I don't think most and I'm sure you agree, you've been a teacher, most teachers don't get out, sit out, get in their car and drive across Houston to suspend kids, right? 
But regardless whether they intend to or not, as I said before, we, we're focused on impact before intention. Correct. So we want to see what the in, impact is having on that student. So most teachers are not doing anything intentionally to students. But regardless of the fact, we still have to address the issue. And um, I would love if I had a, a lot of time next time to show you a video that talks about empathy and uh, and bias. And um, the way you were talking, I thought you'd seen it before, maybe. But anyway, um, I, yeah, I think you're right that we have to, uh, the culture of the school is critical. I mean, I can't explain, I mean, equity is, is important and all that stuff, but the culture and the climate of the school is critical. It has to be conducive for learning for each and every single child. It has to be. And you gotta create that culture for that, that, that to happen. And each building, it starts at leadership. The culture of any school is shaped by the worst behavior leadership is willing to tolerate. Right. And I'm not talking about the students. <laughs> yeah. Students basically just allow what they what they're allowed to do, really. You know, so I'll watch the the adult behavior and things of that nature. All right, blame it on Augustine. He got me off. He, he got me off path now. It's just <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing is the equity policy. And if you um, you have a currently you have an equity policy right now, because Augustine that would take care of some of those things. Because if you want equitable practices, you need to anchor it in an equity policy. Well, the fact that I don't know, I don't. That's my fault, or or we just don't have one. So okay, um, that's all right. You're, you're you're doing a mental assessment right now, right? Exactly. Right. And and then with that equity policy, you can anchor the equity plan and that policy. And equity scorecard is basically said, this is what we're going to do as it relates to equity. And it's a live document. Anybody can go on the website and see it. And we say we're going to uh, re reduce the number of suspensions for Latinx, Latinx boys this percent by this time. Well, people can go and see what you all are doing on that. You know, okay, well, we're going to we're going to hire, you know, 10 percent more administrators of color by this time. And so somebody can just say, okay, you all said that you're going to do this in 2021. What are we looking like? Well, we only hired like 3%. Okay, so what do we, you know, so they can look at this live data. That's what the equity scorecard is. And so all this is part of, you know, just part of the work to get there. And then different types of professional development, like understanding equity, cultural responsive teaching. Uh, Augustine, cultural responsive teaching will go to some of those things around empathy that you talked about. If you know, if you know the students can respond to those students, you know, then you can make that connection with them. Uh, you can empathize more. Trauma-informed care. I just want to stop right here and just mention this to you. I don't know what you all are doing in, in, in Texas, reference to uh, school. I don't know if you're going face-to-face, -face, virtual, hybrid, or whatever. But um, you know, I think the one that the one of the, I think the toughest job is a classroom teacher. You know, followed by a principal and, and superintendent, but a classroom teacher. And when school starts, whether you're in Houston or Louisville or wherever you are, Los Angeles, students are experiencing two pandemics, COVID-19, and they all experienced, uh, many of them experienced some trauma through um, COVID-19, where they know family members, relatives, friends, or things of that nature. And so there's there's gonna be some trauma, students bringing trauma, and teachers and administrators and other people are coming also. And then the whole issue around social justice. And students are gonna bring that into the school also. And so one of the things we're doing in Lexington and Louisville here in Kentucky is, is that we are helping teachers navigate and negotiate those conversations when kids come into school and want to talk about what's happening in the streets. Because I live like 45 minutes from one of the hottest places, Louisville, Kentucky. And so every day it's hot in downtown Louisville. Um, and so those kids are, they're coming to school and they're not going to just leave all that. You know, so we're going through these, we're going through a COVID-19 pandemic, social injustice pandemic, and economic strain pandemic. But the interesting is to really understand equity. We're all going through the storm together, Richard, but we're going through the storm in different ways. Okay, so some people are going through the storm and they're in an ocean line. Some people are going through the storm and they're on a yacht. Some people are going through the storm on a rowboat. Some people are going through the storm in a life lifeboat. And some people are barely hanging on a life preserver. And you cannot use universal strategies to meet those 
individual needs. We are all situated differently. And that's gonna impact public schools or all schools when students start coming back. They're not leaving that at home. And so the trauma-informed care, resp being responsive to the students, all that's gonna be important before they may look at an algebra equation. And so I just wanna make us think about that. With that said, uh, I'm not gonna go through that. Some of the things, you know, we already talked about that. And so I'm just leave it up for um, questions. This is a book called Despite the Best Intentions, How Racial Inequality Thrives in Good Schools. But anyway, um, thoughts, comments, observations. Dr. Cleveland, just to answer your question about do we have a current policy for equity? We do not, but we have pulled down the TASB uh, proposed uh, local policy mm -hmm. for equity. It's AE local, and uh, it will be up for the board's review in the near future. Okay. All right. Great. And I have, if you want to look at some other ones, uh, we have one here in Louisville. We have Seattle has one. Cincinnati has one. Austin has a racial equity policy, but there's some other districts. So, uh, Dr. O'Brien, you want to see some other ones? That's fine too. I can, I can send them to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, comments? Uh, I just wanted to point out that while we may not have a equity policy in writing, that it is part of our mission, vision, and goals that we are reaching out to students where they meet us, where they come to school with their uh, fund of knowledge. We have programs in place. I've been thinking about what your question was earlier. If someone came in from the outside, how would we look to them? And of course, that's a perspective that's difficult to, to come at. But I, I would say that we do a really good job of moving in that direction. Are we there? Are we perfect? No. But we have a great special ed department that is throughout the district on, I, I can remember when my children first came into the system here that, um, um, for example, aside from special ed, because I don't know how, how developed it was across the district. I'm sure it was only limited to a few campuses, but I know that we've expanded the number of campuses that have those departments. But for example, our bilingual department, um, when my children began kindergarten, there were maybe four elementary schools in the district that had bilingual programs, and that's where those children would go. Now it's on every elementary campus in the district. So we're more focused on community schools, uh, going to school where you live and getting the tools, getting the education, whether it's um, uh, special education, uh, bilingual education, uh, maybe a gifted uh, program, but that those have been expanded over the past few years and are evident on all of our campuses. I would also point out um, our move in the last several years to expand our high school programs. Uh, we have three traditional high schools that offer special academy programs and endorsements, but we also have a campus that's a, a early college um, impact high school, and we also have Stewart Career Tech uh, high school where students who are not looking to go to maybe a four-year university at the end, but they're looking to go into a certain field can uh, take classes that lead them to certifications that enable them to be employable when they leave. And we have a, a very high number of students that are military ready by the time they graduate high school. So I feel like we have a very diverse program that we're constantly looking at ways to expand. Um, so I think from the outside perspective, someone just coming in from a neighboring um, district and having a look at us on the surface, now when you dig in, is there room for improvement? Always, and that's of course why we're here. But uh, um, I think that we look pretty good on the outside. Okay, yeah. and on Jessica, the, um... I think you said something really important. The mission is critical. Uh, the mission and vision is, is critical. And I didn't read your mission and vision or anything like that. But um, the, the one of the reasons why the equity policy is good is because, um, one, it anchors best practices. You know, so 
And that's, uh, you know, you want to formalize something that's really good in your district, put it in a policy. That way you formalize it. The other thing is, unfortunately, in play, we got to legislate behavior sometimes. Because <laughs> everybody's not going to do it right or do it at all. But when you say, because it's in policy, you know, that gives the board leverage. You know, that gives the board leverage because you uh, that's one of the main things that you all have uh, influences through your policy. So. Uh, but I do hear him and understand what you're saying too. Um, if I can also, I think that that despite that we do have a bunch of we do have a few things that that I have personally um, some issues with. For example, our African American males. You know, there's a post secondary there. That's probably the the area that we suffer in the most as a community is that they're not signing up for for post secondary ready or post secondary. Um, schools, that's the one that that's the group that's most lowest right after them as Latino males. Um, I know that while it's important for other people to look at us and see what we're trying to do, I think it's also very important to see how the community perceives us as far as equity. And I, and I think that sometimes it's difficult for people to understand what equity means. I, I think that we have a little bit of an issue within our, our, our district bounds of how the how people view us in terms of educating their children or how children view themselves being educated by our school district uh, and that affects our community as well because if you don't feel that you you're a part of this you tend not to be as successful in it um the one question i do have is in developing i know that dr brian said he was pulling down the tasb policy i guess just to, as a as a basis or something because I'm assuming that we as a school district should probably develop one that would cater to our, our community in our area. Is would should the community have representation in developing this equity policy with us? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, I, I think you all have all stakeholders because then you would have and listen to buy in from everyone. I mean, at the end of the day, the board will have to make the decision, but if you get buy in and, and input from all stakeholders, then we all own the policy, just not the board's policy, you know, that everyone and including students will have some say so in that conversation. Well, uh, yes. mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I would like to see in our district is, is it creating a, um, maybe a committee, you know, I, I know that I, I serve on a couple of city committees, but um, it would be, I think, uh, maybe a positive and I'm not necessarily talking to you, Dr. Cleveland at this point, but just thinking out loud, I think I would it would be a great opportunity for us to create a um, equity committee committee where we invite members of the community leadership as well as parents and even kids to come in and help us understand what they're feeling. You know, unfortunately, those those conversations bring some things that we don't like to hear, but those are the things that help us grow. I think. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you. Um, and when Dr. Brown was reading my. Um, Bio, I've served on, we have a, what is called the equity council here. Our district is about close to 50,000 students, uh, very similar in demographics, not as many uh, Latino students close, but not as many, but pretty diverse school district. But we've had an equity council uh, probably since maybe 2001 and it's made up by community members. And so you apply, some of them apply for the, uh, the role on the council and then the board each board member appoints one person. And so the whole purpose is that for the equity council or the committee that you're talking about is to make recommendations and a, an advisory role. They can't tell the board what to do, but they can, you know, advise and make recommendations and they really should work hand in hand with the board and support and coordination, but not, you know, at war with each other. But that's what the council's for to really to keep equity on the radar. And so, I can send your information how those councils are started, how they develop, things like that. But some people do it differently. Some people, uh, the board picks all of them. Some people have uh, community people, community people, and school uh, personnel on those committees. Yeah, so you can do it in a number of different ways. The well, board me, exists. Though. I'm I'm gonna talk about maybe the elephant in the room, the, okay. the a little bit with that problem. And I'm not, you know, I'm not questioning anybody's acquaintances or friends or anything. Um, the problem is we have two people of color on the school board of seven. Mm -hmm. And and I think that if we create something like that, it's gonna have to be more than that because um, I'm not doubting that everybody has friends that are that are 
people of color, but I, picking the right people that are going to be champions in discussing the needs of kids that are, that are not that are needing that. I think mm -hmm. is a big part of it. Yeah, and that's what you have to think about those things, internal issues that I don't, I'm not aware of. Right. Before you do that committee or at council, if you want to call it. Yes. But I just wanted to let you know that those those councils or committees exist. A lot of a lot of school districts have them. Um, anything else? Conversation, thoughts, comments. I do want to say while you are thinking that um, just in all the things we're going through right now, that really keep in mind of our uh, our families and our students uh, around the country is going through all what they're going through. And really keep in mind our classroom teachers. Uh, it's already tough enough to be a classroom teacher, and then to do it in this environment. That um, and I always tell teachers this: so if there's any teachers listening in Baytown, I want y'all to hear this. So a student asked me last semester, said, uh, "Dr. Cleveland, why'd you go into education?" And I said, "Well, I could have became a lawyer and made a hundred thousand dollars, but I became an educator and made a hundred thousand lawyers." <laughs> That's how impactful classroom teachers are. And I just want to make sure we support them and things of that nature. I know you all will. Anything else for me, Dr. O, we good? So very much, Dr. Cleveland. We appreciate your uh, facilitating this training and uh, we will be in touch with you in the near future. All right. Thanks for uh, you all inviting me. You all have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Ms. Woods, we turn it back over to you. <clears throat> All right. Um, so at this time, I wanted to enter into the minutes. I did not announce the start time of our board meeting when we called for our quorum. Ms. Garcia, if you will note that uh, the meeting began at 6.04 p.m. Sorry. <clears throat> now I'd like to move on to agenda item number three. Uh, Mr. Flood, are you ready? This will be our time for citizens participation. <clears throat> in this section of the agenda, can everyone hear me? I'm speaking, okay. Yeah. Um, in this section of the agenda for this meeting, the board permits public comments on agenda items posted with notice of the meeting. Individuals who have signed up, registered prior to the beginning of the board meeting shall be recognized and providing provided an opportunity to speak other individuals who have provided email submissions to the board for consideration will also be noted when addressing the board i encourage you to note your topic issue and to please please refrain from attacking the personal character of any individual student staff member or board member in this section of the agenda Board members may only listen to the individual statement and may not discuss the item with the with the patron or take action on any matter during this portion of the agenda. Normally, public participation time on the agenda is limited to a total of 30 minutes um, and each individual heard is allotted no more than three minutes. However, um, Mr. Flood, how many do you have signed up to speak? Um, Live. I'm sorry, I didn't count them. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a lot. And yes. then do we have, Over. do you know how many we have emails submitted? Okay, due to the uh, number that we have received for citizen participation speakers and submissions, and the board's desire to hear from all of the citizens that we reasonably can tonight as board president under the local authority provided by Goose Creek CISD board policy BED local. I'm going to extend the overall time limit for public comment past the standard 30 minutes. 30, I, excuse me, 30 seconds or 30, 30 minutes overall? The overall time limit, okay. which is typically 30 minutes. I am going to extend the overall time limit past the standard 30 minutes and I am also adjusting the time allotted for each speaker to one minute each. Uh, Board Secretary Sampson will be the timekeeper and will give you a 30 second warning during your time. 
your cooperation and your patience with me and the board and the WebEx technology is appreciated. So uh, we'll begin with the live portion, Mr. Flood, um, if you want to begin. Yes, ma'am. So my first speaker, let me find them. It's going to be Kevin Craven. You are now unmuted. Good evening. My name is Kevin Craven. I'm a graduate class of 88 of Robert E. Lee. Um, I want to, first of all, dive into um, some sentiments that was shared in the last uh, meeting where an individual spoke about the black on black crime in our community, the single parents homes that were in our community and the educational gap that exists in our community. I don't think there's anything that epitomizes Robert E. Lee more than those issues that he addressed. Because in Robert E. Lee, we know that he slaughtered many black slaves on the battlefield. We knew, we, knew through the, we know through the actions of slavery, we know that men were stripped from their homes leaving single parent homes. And we know that his sentiment on education was one where he felt that black slaves were inferior to whites. So I'm a little confused as to why at this point, knowing that what we know about Robert E. Lee Six seconds. And, with the, and with the veil of slavery, of, and the veil of revisionist history being stripped back, uh, while, while we're Mr. at a Craven, point in this conversation- Mr. Craven, yes. thank you for your comments, but your time has expired. We need to move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Victoria Marin. You're now unmuted. Uh, thank you. Good evening, board. I'll rush through this 60 seconds. I'm speaking to you tonight as an alum of the District of Lee College, as a resident of Baytown for over 41 years, and a family that's been here since 1912. Today, I ask you to vote no on your action item of creating a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. At your August 3rd board meeting, you based a PowerPoint on investigating many schools, their names, their history, their mascots, and you skipped over high school. So later in the evening, you reported on Robert E. Lee. You provided an executive summary. So there's obviously already a need, and we know there's a need. The plea to change seconds. Lee has occurred at least three occasions since 1980. As a board of trustees, according to the website, seven member board of trustees acts as the school district's policy making body and is the official representative of the people for all education and Goose Creek Consolidated Independent School District. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Marin. My next person is Susan Cummings. You're now unmuted. Thank you. As a product of Goose Creek Independent School District, a current resident and a member of a family who came to Goose Creek in 1917, I'm asking the Board of Trustees to lead our school district and community into a new era of understanding and tolerance by removing from buildings any name that, har that honors slaveholders, the Confederacy, or white supremacists. Eliminating these names will reflect more accurately the ideals of education. Doing so means looking unflinchingly into the incomplete and seconds. biased history of Goose Creek. It also means recognizing the decades long influence of the United Daughters of Confederacy on all public school books. We cannot have that false history continuing to be taught. Racism can be subtle, it can be blatant, and it causes psychological and physical damages to all communities. So I'm asking the board to understand that education in most 20th century public schools was meant to comfort whites, not educate them. And in doing so, uh, to oppress communities of color. Demonstrate thank, that you're Thank you, Ms. Cummings. Your time thank has you. expired. Thank you. My next speaker is Cecilia 
Pinkles Herds. You're now muted. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak again tonight. I'm a proud member of REL class of 1984, and I want to speak to you guys about um, the committee that's being proposed. There's already a very robust record upon which you can make a decision. I do not believe that a committee is necessary, and I'm very much against the creation of Spain. Sometimes people forget um, that racism is a system, and they after a man adored by the KKK. 30 seconds. It was constructed in 1928. It's part of the must be taken down. It should be part of the equity plan Dr. Cleveland just described, especially if the district actually has two campuses, not allowing students to speak Spanish during their free time. As trustees, you guys are charged with promoting the interests of the school, and that's really a key point. This should not be a contest for which side can get the most letters or signatures on a petition. Time. I leave you with the words of Amelia Earhart. The most effective way to do it is to do it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Hurd. Mr. Flood. All right, my next speaker is Jenny Grimsley. You're now unmuted. Hi, yes, I'm Jenny Grimsley. I was a graduate of our Robert E. Lee High School in 1985, and I bring to you the quote from Maya Angelou, who says, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. I think Dr. Cleveland brought us some really good information this evening um, about equity, and especially when he asked the question, um, do they, when someone comes from outside to look into your school district to see if there's equity, um, then do they have equity? And of course, what, peer, what appears over the door in the one of the major high schools is Robert E. Lee High School, and, and that is not, that the name over the door says that there's not equity in the district. And that can be easily remedied by knowing now what you know, which is to do better and that you have the power to do better. Um, and I think that could easily be start um, to begin to have equity in the district overall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grimsley. Mr. Flood, our next speaker. My next speaker is Kim Kostek. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as an active community member and friend of the district. And right now I am very sad. I am sad that we are discussing the importance of a committee when a short 14 months ago, I stood in front of you of the same board and you supported committees as an appropriate route to gather accurate local data before making lasting change. My 100% attendance rate of these multiple committees that were formed to focus on safety, security, mental health, and well being of our students allowed me to receive data that conflicts with the claims of racial oppression at Lee High School. Seconds. Imagine my surprise seeing hashtag community for a committee, and I am urging you to support a new committee or an existing or add one to the existing subcommittee for the school safety committee. That is designed to recommend appropriate changes in timelines to ensure safe and nurturing learning environments. I'm also very concerned of another hashtag minds already made that was just made aware of me, made aware to me. And I hope that it is not true. It is such Aye. an irresponsible choice. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Kostek. Mr. Flood. My next speaker is Lillian Sockwell. You are now unmuted. Good evening, Dr. O'Brien and trustees. I'm a former PTO board member, mom of a GCC ISD student, and a taxpaying resident of 30 years. I'm here to urge you to vote for a committee representative of Baytown's diversity to investigate the residents' wishes of renaming district facilities. Many in the community, including myself, are very concerned about the lack of financial transparency and a hurried emotional decision. 
In 2016, HISD hurriedly voted to rename seven Houston schools honoring Confederate leaders and were sued by taxpayers, which revealed that the cost of changes would start at over $1 million. We have teachers in our schools using personal money for basic classroom supplies, and a few trustees want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars renaming schools while disregarding Baytown's taxpayers. Use those funds instead to help students pursue academic excellence and college readiness. We need an accurate financial accounting and conversation regarding the use of our taxpayers' dollars. Please vote for a Democratic committee of community members to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sockwell. Our next speaker. Our next speaker is Margaret Matthews. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a Baytown resident, taxpayer, and Goose Creek alumni to urge you to develop a committee of community members to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. To be clear, oppression is systemic and institutional abuse of power by one group at the expense of others, and the use of force to maintain this dynamic if you do not recall the school safety and security committee as a result of Senate Bill 11, our district has gone above and beyond by creating multiple diverse subcommittees that would have identified and addressed the results of the mental abuse that is claimed. School board members were in agreement with having committees then, so why not now? Please do not disregard this community. You're elected to represent. We want you to vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. My next speaker is Dina Southall. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I am coming to you as a Baytown resident and Goose Creek parent to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. According to the TASB social media guidelines for school board members, Social media posts by a board member expressing an opinion on pending matters may be considered evidence of bias or prejudgment on the issue. I, it is. It also states that evidence of bias may be used to exclude the individual board member or call into question the val validity of board action. One board member spoke to a public seconds. talk radio, radio podcast as a representative of the GCCISD school board. He did not correct his introduction as a school board president and clearly advocated on a decision about renaming the district facility before any decision had been made. There are at least two school, school board members that are actively advocating and are or donating funds to renaming a district facility on social media. It is apparent these individuals are not impartial decision makers and I feel these facts should be noted uh, by the entire board. We want in favor of a community committee. Thank, thank uh, you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Southall. My next speaker is Rhonda Lopez. You're not unmuted. Ms. Lopez? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. A dear district board and Dr. O'Brien, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Rhonda Lopez. I'm a lifelong resident of Baytown, a proud Gander alumna of the class of 1982, and I support the changing the name of Robert E. Lee High School. This idea of changing the name in Baytown is not a new one. Students of color and their allies have wanted this change for many, many years. The whitewashing of the man Robert E. Lee and what he fought for has been brought to bear. Most recently, current REL students sought for the removal of a uh, portrait of Mr. Lee on campus. Thousands of current students and alumni no longer wish to be part of this charade. It is time for the board to move forward and rid our community of this vestige of oppression. Developing a committee to investigate the need to rename Lee is a stalling task tactic and a way to avoid responsibility. There have been numerous outcries as the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated, the time is always right to do what is right. The students of GCCISD and Baytown need this board to choose courage over comfort and move us toward a more equitable environment by naming Robert uh, e. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Mr. Flood.
My next person is Nicholas Rice. You're now unmuted. Good evening. I come to you as a Baytown resident and urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. Following GCC ISD's guidelines for committee selections, we request this particular committee be overseen by district administration and include a diverse group comprised of community members to include students, parents, teachers, alumni, business owners, and no more than two board members. It is disheartening to know that in the current school safety committee of the two board members selected, only one attended any meetings and his attendance was limited to the first meeting on August 29, 2019. If there are truly concerns about the mental health of students and recent claims of oppression, where were they when this committee was meeting? Whomever is chosen, I urge their active participation. Please do not dismiss this community you are elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. My next speaker is uh, Rebecca Boudreau. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a current resident of Baytown and a parent of a GCC ISC student to urge you to develop a committee of community members to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. I would ask you if there are as many or any claims of oppression and racial injustice, why are we not actively investigating them or doing something about it? Two current board members are listed on our school safety and security committee booklet as members. They could have presented emails and letters and claims of so many of these things they claim. There are so many questions to be addressed and answered. Instead, they have only opted to change the name of our schools. Please do not dismiss this community committee idea. You're elected to represent our people and we want your vote in favor of community committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Boudreau. Mr. Flood. My next speaker is Angel Brazil. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I'm coming to you as a Baytown resident, Goose Creek alum, and wife of a former Goose Creek teacher to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. GCCISD has numerous committees that allow constituents to have a conversation about what is best for the students. It's no secret that public trust in government institutions is low, but boards that engage their communities are involving the public in big decisions and re-engaging citizens with their representative voice in public education governance. The decision on removing a district facility should be based on the findings of a committee that the weight of the decision will affect. We can not only consider emotions of one side over the other because all members of the community have strong emotions about the civil discourse we find ourselves in today. Please do not disregard the community you are elected to represent. We want your favor to vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brazel. My next speaker is Ger- Gerard Martier. You're now unmuted. To all members of the board with open hearts and open minds, let us all do good, be good. Part of the real work of change happens when we advocate for the youth and future generations. Whether it is tonight or September 9th, will you be doing something that your future self would be proud of? Think about how avoidance perpetuates pain. We cannot fix the harshness we do not face, but when we address issues, we grow and live better lives. Maya Angelou put it best, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Follow motion tonight to address the culture inequalities and broken racial relationships and erase the systemic implicit bias. Invoke the procedures for the seven district trustees to place a vote tonight to cultivate the commitment culture and change the name of Baytown Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martyr. Our next speaker, Mr. Flood.
Our next speaker is Emma Pumeriga. You are now unmuted. Hi, this is Emmy Pumarega. Thank you for taking my call this evening. Uh, I'm an REL graduate, uh, class of 1991, Gander Band, top 10 National Merit finalist, and I was admitted to Yale University on the basis of my education at Lee High School. I had a wonderful time as uh, a Lee alum and in my high school time there. Um, and I'm calling to say that I don't believe that 30 seconds. any of my happy any of my happy memories um, are going to be erased by renaming the school. I urge the school board to vote to rename Lee High School and uh, and the legacy of Jim Crow, uh, which is reflected in the name. Uh, it won't hurt any of us grads a bit. Once a gander, always a gander. Thank you for taking my call. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Ms. Pumarega. Next speaker, Mr. Flood. Our next speaker is Samuel Woodard. You're now unmuted. Hello. Uh, God bless you all. My name is Samuel Woodard. I have been a Cat Sing Baytown resident for the past 30 years. The remain the remake of Lee High School is the moral and right thing to do. During my education from GCCISD, I was blessed to have some of the best teachers and coaches that taught me some amazing lifelong lessons. But I also had some teachers and coaches teaching us under the Jim Crow racist era. The time is now for those that want to keep the REL name to please know and understand that you are condoning the past evils of 30 slavery. seconds. Changing the name will not erase history or the evils of slavery, but the new name will help develop brighter, younger, amazing minds for the better of our loving world. Jesus Christ is love. To God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Mr. Woodard. My next speaker is Steve Sybeck. You are now unmuted. Good evening, Dr. O'Brien and members of the board. I come to you as a GCCISD alum and grandfather of two students to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for remain, renaming district facilities. We, the community, implore you to follow the core values and ethical standards you promised to adhere to when taking public office. If there are claims by students, teachers, and administrators of oppression and racial injustice, then we ask for the opportunity to investigate and the time to make sound, wise decisions that are not politically motivated, but relevant to our district. Of the 565 members of the Unity Group on Facebook, only 20% are listed as current Baytown residents compared to our Save Lee page with 3,093 members of which 50% are GCCISD residents. That should say something. Please do not disregard this community you were elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sybeck. All right, my next speaker is Cindy Foster, but you're logged in multiple times, so I'm not sure which one I'm gonna unmute. Cindy? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Before, Good evening. Before feedback, you, so you may you, have to... Yeah, before you start, you might wanna mute one of your devices, Ms. Other Foster. devices. Uh, okay. I don't think I have anything else. Yeah, you've got multiple devices in the same room connected because we're getting feedback. Okay, is that better? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Okay, good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a 1976 graduate of Robert E. Lee High School and urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming the district facilities. 
Studying for a community committee is formed does not mean you as a board are not doing your job and that you are willing to pulling for the delay tactic. It means you are abiding by the technical standards you agreed to when you accepted your seat. It is what is right and what is responsible. Board should always view the community engagement as a strategic pro proactive opportunity to strengthen their school systems. Please do not dismiss, deprive, disregard the community you are elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of the community committee. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Our next speaker. My next speaker is Virginia Rogers. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a Baytown resident and taxpayer to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. A GCC ISD board member stated, our core values at GCC ISD include providing a nurturing environment for all students with integrity, respect, humility, and transparency in an environment where diversity is respected. But also included in the board's core values is collaborative community and parental involvement, both of which are being denied when depriving the community and parents a voice in support of or opposition to renaming district uh, facilities and the use of taxpayer money. The district needs to be transparent and open to community input. Please do not disregard this community you're elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. All right, my next speaker is Cecilia Cravery. You're now on mute. Good evening. I come to you as a Baytown resident to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. Forming a district, a diverse committee to investigate the need will enable us to address desires of the community, financial impact, if grants would be available, underlying concerns of oppression in our community, historical landmark impact, reducing the public and private attacks against our school board and administration, allowing proper investigation to ensure that all actions taken by this board are legal and ethical. Please do not dismiss this community you are elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cravey. Mr. Flood, our next speaker, please. The next speaker is Kenrick Griffith. You're now unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you. I come to you as a member of Robbery Elite Class of 99 and a concerned Baytown resident. Some individuals feel changing a school's name that has ties to Confederacy is a current crisis. When the real crisis is this, is this pandemic and trying to feed and raise and educate our children. There's a mountain of evidence and data that proves this pandemic emotionally, financially, and physically affects our children. Having hurt feelings over the name of a school is not, it's not a crisis. That is not to say it is important and, in, uh, and a valid topic of concern, but it's a topic that can can and should wait until we can get better, better figure out how to handle the current situation. Since this is not a crisis on par with the current pandemic, there is no need to bypass a formation of, of, a, com uh, of a community committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Mm -hmm. 
My next speaker is Blake Stanford. You're now unmuted. Good evening. My name is Blake Stanford. I'm a citizen of Texas. I'm a sixth generation Texan. My ancestors fought in the Civil War for the Confederacy, and Lee is a name that has been bestowed upon many of my family members. I'm also a 1977 graduate of Robert E. Lee High School in Midland, Texas. As you may know, the Board of Midland Independent School District recently voted to change the name of my alma mater. 30 seconds. Uh, from Robert E. Lee to a name to be decided. Uh, this is called progress, and I, I think there are many things that may have looked at fine two months ago, but seem different now. I would urge you to change your name as certainly you realize that Robert E. Lee High School in Baytown is the last high school named after Robert E. Lee, uh, probably in the country. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. My next speaker is David Ryland. You're now unmuted. Or Ridland. Mr. Ridland, can you hear us? We can't hear you. All right, I'll go to the next speaker. My next speaker is Brian Patterson. You're now unmuted. Thank you. To the GCCISD School Board, my name is Brian Patterson, Robert E. Lee Class of 1999. I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you. This is truly an important time for our school district, our community, and our country. We're fighting a global pandemic, and in the same regard, another battle continues for the equality of all Americans. Just like this diversity workshop, a dialogue in exchange needs to continue about what's wrong in our country. It's time to do what's right, and I fully support the renaming of Robert E. Lee High School. In addition, I vehemently oppose agenda item 4B and encourage the board to take full responsibility instead of a committee for this decision as elected officials should. It would only delay a decision in spite of the aforementioned, making it obvious that the choice to rename to be so clear to act upon. It's time to eliminate the name. Thank you, and I yield my time to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. My next speaker is Kendall Merritt. You're now unmuted. Okay. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a former student to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. On November 7th, 2019, a member of district administration requ requested the attendees of the school safety and security committee to provide questions relating to school and safety concerns. GCC ISD sent anonymous surveys to multiple junior highs and high schools, including Robert E. Lee, to be completed by student, campus administration, and district administration. The data was complied and presented at the February 6, 2020 meeting and showed no mention seconds. of feelings or oppression of racial injustice. We questioned when active board members receiving emails claimed recent oppression as it is apparent this request to rename is politically motivated and not due to specific instances within our district. Please do not dismiss, deprive, disregard this community you're elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Merritt. I'm going to try David Reedland again. Mr. Reedland, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Good evening, members of the uh, of the board and Dr. O'Brien. 
I come to you this evening to urge you to develop a committee to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. A committee is a board of persons delegated to consider, investigate, and take action on tasks that require an assembly. It is an ongoing collaborative process which the district works with the public to build understanding, guidance, and active involvement in education. Creating a diverse community committee will determine the boundaries of which facilities need to be changed, which do not, and the best way to go about implementing change. Please do not dismiss, disregard this community you're elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community committee. I'm a lifelong resident of Baytown and a product of Goose Creek Independent School District, grades Ty. 1 through 12. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Ty. Thank you, Mr. Reedland. My next speaker is Katia Smith. You're now unmuted. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. O'Brien. I come to you as a sophomore at Robert E. Lee High School that walks the halls individuals claim are full of racial oppression to tell you that this is not true. I feel confident you can vote for forming a diverse committee to investigate the needs that will be able to address. When desires of the community Two, financial impacts. Three, if grants would be available. Four, underlying needs of oppression in our community. Five, historical landmark impacts. Six, reducing the public and private attacks of our school boards and administration. Please. Seven, allowing proper investigation to ensure that all actions taken by this board are legal and ethical. I beg of you to please do not deprive this community, community you are elected to represent. We want your vote in favor of a community, a community committee to investigate if the names of district facilities need to be changed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. My next speaker is Adrian Tanner. You're now unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you and good evening for your time. I am a GCC alum, a 1990 graduate of Lee, and I was senior class secretary for my class. I am encouraging the members of this board not to place the consideration investigation regarding the renaming of Lee High School on the shoulders of the committee, the com uh, of the community. The community was not elected to uphold and actualize the mission and core values of GCC ISD. You all were. The mission of GCCISD states that it is committed to developing the whole child and core values reference things like children first in a seconds. safe and nurturing educational environment and diversity respected. But how much respect are you showing children when you place them in the name of a school that bears the name of a man who didn't even believe that black children deserve to be treated as human beings? It is not lost on me that renaming the school a sensitive subject, but it doesn't mean that the conversation and corrective action should be ignored. No one wants to erase a fond memory or an accomplishment of a classmate, good times or camaraderie experience. That is called being a gander, but make no mistake, the name Robert right. E. does in fact taint the experience for black students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tanner. My next speaker is Danielle DeVore. You're now unmuted. Hi, yes, my name is Danielle DeVore. I am a resident of Baytown and also a graduate of Lee High School class of 2001. I asked the board member to take the recommendations made by Dr. Cleveland in which he stated that leadership shapes the climate and culture at a school. I know that this is not an ideal time to discuss changing the name, but if not now, then when? So I ask you to vote in favor for a committee to investigate a name change for district facilities. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. DeVore. My next speaker is Janet Harrelson. It looks like you're connected a couple of times, so I'm gonna unmute one and see if it works. Can yes, you hear sir. Me? Yes. Yeah, you may want to disconnect one of your other ones. See, I don't have anything else. 
Are you still there? Pictures that when I try to disconnect one, it disconnects both. Okay, no, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, members of the board, I'm Dr. O'Brien. Thank you for your service. I come to you as a long time and still current Baytonian, proud Gander, class of 70, homeowner, taxpayer. You're, you're breaking up, Ms. Harrelson. We can't hear you. We're losing you. Process. As I've listened this evening to you tonight, it has become clear that it's not the name that's the problem. There was no racism when I was a student at Robert E. Lee. Changing the name will not change the thoughts and attitudes of those practicing racism today. Please do not choose to disregard this community you're elected to represent. Too many voices have said, leave our schools alone. We want your vote in favor of a community committee to identify all questions and concerns prior to facing the unknown. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Harrelson. Our next speaker is Cynthia Pizana. You're now unmuted. Hello, um, I just want to speak about this committee that's on the agenda. Um, I hear really to encourage you all to vote no on this committee. I really do feel that this committee is really just a way for you guys to stall on this decision. Uh, you guys were elected to make this decision. You already know it's time to dename and rename Robert E. Lee High School. Um, from the last meeting, it seems to me y'all have to rename another building. And I really would like to make you guys aware of a GoFundMe. Uh, that was created by the community to offset these costs um, that will incur for this project. Um, a wise woman once told me that there are some things whose worth cannot be measured in dollars and cents, and this is one of those. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pizana. My next speaker is Felicia Young. You're now unmuted. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me speak tonight. I'm a lifelong resident of Highlands and a um, graduate of Goose Creek uh, from 2008. Um, you know, we know that the, the name of Robert E. Lee High School was pushed by Jim Crow era laws and sentiment, including um, the KKK, uh, huge at the time in Baytown. And we know that we had the last high school in the country that still bears this name. The time is uh, now for white Baytonians to, to stop pretending that racism doesn't exist, to stop Third talking step. over black and brown people who have spoke on their experience. And I ask you to move forward in, um, as is your authority as the elected board to change the name without delay, without the need for a committee and do what is right and correct and not to delay or defue justice. Uh, you have heard from our community. You know that this is what we we want, um, and, and I ask you to consider uh, changing the names of other offending schools as well, including Ross S. Sterling, which was uh, a member of the KKK. Thank you again, and uh, uh, please right. move forward to, to change the traditions as we have in the past with the Brigadiers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Our next speaker is Joe Theory. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, Dr. O'Brien and the board members. My name is Joe Theory. I'm a 1988 graduate of Robert E. Lee, a resident of Baytown for 50 years. I do support the change of the name of Robert E. Lee. For 92 years, Robert E. Lee has existed under a distorted history. District members, please do your elected duty and make a decision regarding renaming Robert E. Lee. There's no need to develop a committee. As a man of color, racism is Third felt effect. in many ways. And I'm reluctant to believe anybody that says different. The Dr. Cleveland just mentioned racism in society is racism in school. Thank you for your time and I appreciate you considering renaming Robert E. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Thier Theory. My next speaker is Herman Hobson. You're now unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, board members and Dr. O'Brien. My name is Herman Hobson. 
I'm a Gander alumni class of 2015. As you know, the issue before us is a historical issue, a heritage issue, a financial issue, a demographics issue, a numbers issue, and a memories issue. But most importantly, it's a morality issue. Tonight, I implore you to do but one thing. Look within yourselves and see what kinds of human beings you want to be remembered as. The facts are that Lee fought to maintain slavery, to keep black people in bondage, to ensure the black mind, spirit, and soul, to have the right to rape and impregnate black women, to sell black families and keep them apart, and to keep black Americans illiterate so that we cannot fight battles just like the one we stand here fighting today. The moral issue is this. Will you continue to honor a man of oppression and have a blight on the GCC ISD name by having a school with an offensive, morally decadent name? I implore you to change the name now, because remember this, what you don't change, you choose. And do you really want to um, choose the side of a slaver? Um. Thank you, Mr. Hobson. Our next speaker is Daisy Moses. You're now unmuted. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Daisy Moses and I am a 2017 graduate from Lee. Instead of speaking on my various accolades or memories from the four years I was there, I will be directing your attention to the agenda action item 4B. <laughs> the same power that was voted on invested in every board member, for example, cutting the citizens speaking time from three minutes to one minute in the, in the meeting should be the very same power that votes on the denaming of the school. <clears throat> a system cannot fail those that it was never designed to protect and the PowerPoint presentation on the history of Robert Ely High School left out exactly which community voted on the name and who it was built to serve, the non-black community. <clears throat> this is a fact that does not need a committee and was failed to be presented accurately. I support changing the name of Robert Ely High School and ask that you do the same. May the quote Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere from Martin Luther King Jr. Remind you of the core principles of your duties. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moses. My next speaker is Neil Hernandez. You're now unmuted. Thank you. Good evening to all. Remember, I had a diversity workshop today. You ought to pay attention to the lack of diversity from those calling for this sham committee. Agenda item 4B should be rejected. It was never discussed in last week's meeting. We already have a citizens committee. It's you, the school board. We elect you for these very reasons. And I trust that each and every one of you are capable of executing your duties dil diligently and honorably. Besides students, parents, community members, and alumni have already investigated this issue and made their desires to rename the school public. There's a petition with nearly 4,000 signatures on change.org. And just this year, Lee students, actual students, organized and started a petition to remove the portraits of General Lee from campus. What more do you need? Members 42 miles away from Baytown is a home of Juneteenth, Galveston, Texas. 42 miles away and 155 years later, we're debating if we should honor a general who tried to enslave the, our neighbor's ancestors. You know what the right thing is to do. You don't need me to tell you that. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. My next speaker is Taklisha Blanchard. You're now unmuted. Ms. Blanchard, can you hear us? We're not hearing you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. Good evening. I'll be utilizing my time to address agenda item 4B. A committee by definition is a group of people appointed for a specific function, typically consisting of members of a larger group. Community members are not a larger group of trustees. Rather, they are constituents who have already played their role by electing those voices who they felt correlated with their ideologies. According to the district website, the board acts officially as a committee of the whole. It begs the question as to what need is there for, to form an additional committee. To form a committee of community members leaves open much ambiguity. Who will seconds. authorize the appointment of these members? Will there be representation from both sides? How much weight does the committee hold in the decision-making process? 
Given this factually based information, I ask that no committee be formed, rather simply a vote from the seven elected officials whose job description details this is their role. We have a committee. That is you. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Blanchard. My next speaker is Randy Dunn. You're now unmuted. Thank you and good evening. I'm Randy Dunn, Robert E. Lee High School class of 1976. Just as steps have been taken to minimize threats from the coronavirus pandemic, so much also so must steps be taken to minimize threats from this ongoing pandemic of systemic racism and social injustice. There is an urgent need to rename Robert E. Lee High School as an important first step in protecting students from this long running pandemic. I support the school name change, which is what is best 30 seconds for, for all of the students, and it is morally the right thing to do. We need to remove things that dis disenfranchise our students, as Dr. Cleveland said tonight. There has been plenty of public input and discussion regarding renaming Lee High School, so the school board should be ready to act on this matter now. I encourage the school board to take responsibility of acting on this decision as elected as elected officials should. So I oppose the agenda item 4B. Uh, this name, name change is needed immediately to improve safety, well-being, and success of all the district students. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Dunn. My next speaker is Charles Cruz. You're now committed. Mike check. Yep. 1807, Robert E. Lee, born in Virginia, attended Military Academy at West Point, New York, and is a lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers, 1846 to 1848, Captain Lee's first combat duty in the Mexican-American War. Robert E. Lee participated in Scott's campaign from Veracruz, Mexico to Mexico City. This is a war in which Lee fought and won. 1852 to 1859, Robert E. Lee serves as superintendent of West Point. 1860, Lieutenant Colonel Lee sent to Fort Brown near current day Brownsville, Texas. 1860, Lincoln elected president in November, South Carolina, first to secede in December. 1861, January, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana secede. February, Texas secedes. Lee returns to Virginia rather than serve in the Confederacy. 1861, March, Lee appointed Colonel of U.S. 1st Cavalry Regiment by President Lincoln, swear to the United States of America. April 20th, Colonel Robert E. Lee resigns from the United States Army to become a traitor. Change the name, we do not honor traitors. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Madam President, we are down to, um, we've tried to contact everybody. Um, I do have on here a Sarah Graham, but I have multiple people that are just signed in with just Sarah on the first name. So if you want to start with the letters and we'll try to reach out to her or how do you want to proceed or what do you want to do? Um, I would take a recommendation for a five minute break before we start the letters. Okay. If <laughs> And that'll give you a minute to try to contact those and us a minute to you second that recommendation. Okay, this we'll be back five minutes. Don't go away. My apologies to everyone for the delay in return. We had some technical and legal issues. So we are prepared to hear um, another citizens participation live. Mr. Flood, I leave it to you. Yes, ma'am. Sarah Graham, you uh, you are unmuted and can now start your your talk. Mr. Sampson, if you'll keep time. Got gotcha. you. Ms. Graham, we're not hearing you. Um, are you are you there? Are you unmuted on your end?
Still not hearing you, Ms. Graham. Hello, can you all hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. That was like the longest break on record. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> all right, are y'all ready for me to speak? Yes, ma'am. You begin all when you're ready. Right. Hello, board, Dr. O'Brien, Baytown, former students, and everybody in between. This is Sarah Graham, and I come to you as a vested citizen for all ethnic backgrounds, but I also come to you as a scientist seeking fact, not opinion. I am urging you to develop a committee and vote yes for 4B. Guys, you do need to do what is morally, ethically, and quite frankly, legally right for this town. To quote bullet points that I pulled from the GCCISD board member ethical standard, number one, I will base my decisions on fact rather than supposition, opinion, or public favor. I will make no personal promises or take private action that may compromise my performance or my responsibilities. I will consistently uphold all applicable laws, rules, policies, and governance. Guys, do not dismiss, deprive, disregard this community, your elected officials. We want you to vote in favor of that community committee. Do what is right. I love you guys. Y'all are working working hard on this, but listen, hashtag community for a committee, hashtag mind already made, Good time. do what's right. Good time, sir. Thank you, Ms. Graham. Mr. Flood, did we have any others on the video conference submission? No, ma'am, I think that completes our list. Okay, <clears throat> at this point in time, we have heard from all who wish to be heard live on video telecommunications due to the overwhelming number of written submissions. I defer to our public participation information, which states that um, you may submit your written comment provided by email. Sub written comments submitted to the board for consideration on, on any general item or any agenda item via email by 3 p.m. of the day of respected board meeting. Board meeting, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I've had coffee. Um, we at this time are not going to read all 160 emails that we received. We let it be known that receiving and reviewing these emails by each board member from the public before or during the board's consideration of the item constitutes hearing public comment. Because of the number of emails that we've received, we will each be given a copy of the ones that were sent through publicparticipation.com so that we may further review them and consider them before any action would be taken on a agenda item related to said emails. At this time, I move us on to agenda item number four, action items. Dr. O'Brien, you're muted. We're still, yeah, we're still not hearing you. You're unmuted, but you're not vocal. Hang on. Thank you. Can you there hear you me? are. Yes, sir. Thank you. At this time, administration recommends the consideration of the foreign trade zone agreement with A and R Logistics Incorporated and its approval. A second. I have a motion from Mr. Laredo on agenda item 4A, consideration of foreign trade zone agreement with A and R Logistics. Do I have a second? Mr. I'm sorry, was that Mr. Poppy? Okay, so a motion from Mr. Laredo, a second from Mr. Poppy. Do we have any discussion or questions concerning the consideration of a foreign trade zone agreement? No questions, no comment at this time. All board members in favor of this motion, please raise your right hand or say aye. 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 We have seven, four, that would leave zero against and zero abstaining. Motion passes. 
on agenda item 4B, the consideration to develop a committee of community members to investigate the need for renaming district facilities. I would entertain a motion to move this to a future agenda so that public participation comments submitted in written form can be considered before any action on this item, agenda item is taken. Do I need to make a, do I need a motion to move that? I think it's my discretion. Just in case I would move that we hear or move that uh, action item 4B to the September 8th meeting. I'll September 9th. September next meeting. September X meeting, okay. Yes. I'll second that. Yeah, I'm, so we have a motion from Mr. Clem and a second from Mrs. Guy to um, defer, okay, continue this agenda item to a later meeting, providing for expanded opportunity for public comment. All right, um, any my motion discussion? Was the, the, okay, my so motion was specifically the next meeting. Yes, specifically to September 9th, all right. September X. <laughs> okay, is there any questions or further comments on the agenda, the motion made by Mr. Clem? Question. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Mr. Sampson? Aren't we, uh, don't we have a standing procedure for uh, naming schools and stuff that's already in our uh, board? Pack, I mean, board uh, book. Forming committees is part of that policy. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Um, we are, uh, uh, okay, so that's not relevant to the motion that's on the floor. So why is it not relevant that we have a policy already of naming schools? Of naming, but we're discussing renaming and those do not fall under the same purview well it has renaming and naming but they um we have separate policies for naming than and renaming um didn't find one. that's a, that's under our cw local in our uh board policy okay whatever you say okay so i have a motion on the floor from mr clem and I had a second from Ms. Guy. So at this time, all members in favor of motion on the floor, please raise your right hand. That's one, two, three, four. For, okay, so there, I'm counting on the screen here. One, okay, raise your right hand, I'm sorry. All, all in favor, one, two, three, four. Four. All, any opposed? Raise your right hand. We have two opposed and one abstention. So motion passes as presented. All right, that is all of number four on the agenda. We would move to number five. I would entertain Ms. Woods, a motion. Ms. Woods, I have one, one thing to share. If okay. I could. Uh, it'll be on the September 9th board meeting uh, formally, but I did want to give a shout out to one of our business partners who has made a donation to Goose Creek CISD to uh, the COVID relief fund. Uh, Exxon Mobil has made a donation pallets of sanitizer and financial contributions that will uh, assist the school district as we move into the start of the new school year. And I wanted to give them a shout out and appreciation for their thoughtfulness during a time in which we're all struggling. They're focused on our children and what we can do to keep our children and our faculty safe. And I wanted to Thank them for their business partnership. Thank you. Thank you, ExxonMobil. All right, so I will entertain a motion for agenda item number five. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> Mutiny on the bounty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laredo. We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Cotter. All in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed? 
Meeting adjourned. 9.02 p.m.